morning. It's very nice to be here this morning and to hear this fine report of how the Lord's work is growing. That's what we're here for. That's what we're happy to always hear, the work of the Lord increasing. And uh, when I got up this morning, I, I thought I did you an evil. Uh, I brought some Indiana weather down to visit you. <laughs> Uh, for, for my first time, I seen ice in Phoenix outside of the ice house, you know. But, but this was on the street this morning, ice. My wife got up and she said, is this Phoenix? I said, I think so. I said, it would come in wrong last night. But it was certainly surprising to see ice in Phoenix. Well, I said, if you can just get roused up enough to come over to the breakfast, the ice will all melt over there. I said, <laughs> Because the presence of the Lord always melts away all the coldness. So glad to be here this morning with Brother and Sister William, Brother Rose, and all the staff. and So happy to be back at the Ramada again. There's something about this place, and I sit along the roads in my travel. I think about the meetings I've been in here before, of the Ramada. And we're here now to start a series of meetings with our brethren around through the valley prior to the, the businessman's convention. And uh, how many ministers are here this morning? I see your hands everywhere. Oh, this is, well, we're in business, all right. We're still, let them know that we're in business too. The greatest business in the world, saving souls. Amen. And we ministers are certainly happy this morning to join hands with this staff of, of Christian laymen to, uh, for helpers and partners in this work to help save souls to the kingdom of God. So grateful for this effort. I was listening the other day on a radio broadcast as I was driving along, and there was an attorney that said, uh, a great remark that I thought was outstanding. He said, how it is that in this day that we know that we're facing the end time. He said, and to see laymen and ministers just settle down and not get their righteous indignation stirred uh, to see the world so grossed in sin as it is that both minister and layman should be pressing every moment to the coming of the Lord so close at hand, and we don't seem to be enthused about it as we should be. I was speaking the other day on the subject of being sincere. Uh, we believe as full gospel people that we have the truth, the truth of the gospel, we realize that there's much we can improve on, on this. And we're looking forward to the time that when all the loose ends of these great revivals has come across the world in the last few centuries, well, since the falling away of the church and then the dark age and then these great warriors came forth for truth and they would live long enough to get it kind of halfway established and then little loose ends would run out. We're told in Revelations 10 that there will be a messenger in the last day who will gather up these little ends and will bring them together and then the mystery of God would be finished at the sounding of this angel which was a messenger of the earth and then one came down from heaven with his hands up rainbow over his head and swore that there'd be time no more. An angel taking an oath. And when we see this thing materializing Oh, how sincere we should be. All promises of God are true, but they're on conditions. No matter how fundamentally right we are, we've got to approach it in the right way. Now, a man can be fundamentally right and still not receive the blessings of God because it's approached in the wrong way. It goes upon conditions. For instance, when Ahab and Jehoshaphat was together, and Ramoth Gilead really belonged to Israel fundamentally because the land's divided by Joshua, uh, through Joshua by God, had 
been given to Israel, and the Syrians has taken the the land and fill in the stomachs of the enemy with the food that should have been given to Israel. Fundamentally, Ahab was right. And that's the reason 400 Hebrew prophets with one accord was prophesying going up the realm of Gilead. Fundamentally, they were right. But Ahab wasn't right himself. And when this one little man stood up by the name of Micah, the son of Amon, and saw a vision... Now, one man's vision against 400 trained prophets, but the man's vision compared with the word, that's the reason he knew it was right. And see, it's on conditions. We must be sure when Hannah prophesied and took the yoke off of Jeremiah's neck, that Israel was to be uh, the vessels of the Lord rather down and under Nebuchadnezzar and all the kingdoms around have been given to this heathen Nebuchadnezzar down in Babylon here was Israel making their sacrifices and just as religious and fundamental as they could be but yet the sincerity had left it and they was given down there for, for slaves to serve Nebuchadnezzar Nebuchadnezzar for all these years. And Jeremiah had a, a yoke around his neck and God had told him no matter what prophet prophesies, what dreamer dreams or anything else contrary to what he said, it was wrong. And there stood up Hena, Hena just as sincere as any man could be and prophesied with a message, Thus saith the Lord. Well, of course, the people could clap their hands on that. That's true. Thus saith the Lord. They'll be back in two years, in the sight of two full years, and walked up to that vindicated prophet, tucked that off of his neck and broke it, and said, Thus saith the Lord. Remember what Je Jeremiah said? Hannah, amen. So be it. The Lord perform your words. But let us remember there's been prophets before us. They prophesied against great kingdoms, against war, and so forth. But a prophet is only known when his prophecy comes to pass. And Hanan broke the yoke, and then, you know what, God told him. I think we Pentecostal people, fundamentally, full gospel is truth. But there's more goes with it. Is that deep sincerity... Of what God has given us, we must approach it with respects and, and love and in a humble attitude. I think that's what we need. And now, in this coming meetings, I, I really don't know where I'm going, Brother Williams. It's around from place to place. Uh, amongst my brethren, all of you pray that God will help us. That there will be the sick healed. And there will, uh, first thing, let me say first, there will be souls saved. And, and believers filled with the Holy Spirit. The sick people healed. God received glory and His church grow for the kingdom of God. And I'm here to help in every way that I can. In this I have, I think it's mostly full gospel people of the... Assemblies of God and the four square and the church of God and the oneness, brethren, and all, all together. And that's the way I, I like it. Where we can go to each place and all come together. And a Pentecost is really not an organization. It's an experience that we find that our little thoughts that used to be in years gone by, that just one group called the Pentecostals has all got this blessing, we find that God just tore our little ideas all to pieces. He brought in Catholics, Presbyterians, Methodists, Baptists. He gave those the Holy Ghost who served yes. did His will. Yes. And He doesn't change. He cannot change. His attitude must always be the same. His decisions are perfect to begin with. He has to alter nothing. His words, he's sovereign. He has not to change anything, and he never does change. So we're happy this morning that Christ lives. 
And as the song says, how do you know he lives? He lives within our hearts. And we know that we're sure of it. So approaching the revival, coming on from church to church, and then back here to the Ramada for the convention, let's go with reverence, deep sincerity, humble praying, and believing God. Now, I know we stay a little long each time, but I don't want to do that in these meetings. I want to get in there and get the people out and get home and do what I can for the kingdom and take off somewhere and pray the rest of the night if I want to talk a while with the Lord and not hold you off while I'm doing it. And now this morning, I feel like this breakfast is kind of an opening to the, this is the Alpha and at the last of the convention is the Omega of the, of the revival. And now let's just bow our heads a moment sincerely as we approach His throne of grace. And there's no doubt but what there's many requests in here this morning. But while we're praying and you'd like to be remembered, would you just raise your hand and hold beneath that the secret that you want God to do for you. Thank you. Most holy and reverent God, the Almighty, we approach thy throne now as we come up from this place called the Ramada Inn. We pass beyond by faith the moon, the stars, over the milky white way into the presence of God as we stand by his great white throne looking across to that golden lights where God alone can dwell, we see between we and this altar there is a bloody sacrifice laying there. As our brother and sister so expressed it a while ago, that one name, Jesus and he promised when he was here on earth, if you ask the Father anything in my name, I'll grant it. There we see him today standing there to make good every word and every promise that he made. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you will let us come into thy presence with sincerity and with faith believing now that you will answer this that we are asking. And the first of all things we ask for ourselves, the forgiveness of all of our trespasses, and all the things that we have did which would be innumerable, Lord. And we pray that you will forgive us and let that precious blood of the sacrifice on the altar this morning cleanse us from all unrighteousness, all selfishness, and all that's contrary, Lord, to Thy great commandments and Thy desires for us. May we this morning, Lord, in another way or in another time Consecrate ourselves to Thee. And in our humility, believe that You're going to stir a revival through this valley. And we are so weak, Lord, to try to undertake such a great effort. It would be totally impossible. But Thou, O God, can take the weak things of the earth and can make mighty works of God by them. We humble ourselves as believers in asking that You will take these weak vessels and will work Your works through them that we might see a great results when this meeting is over, that the work of God has begun to be made manifest 
afresh in this valley. Bless all of our brethren, the churches, each denomination, all of its members, and this businessman, this laity who has, has consecrated their lives to Thee. We pray, Father God, that You will bless them in their coming convention. And all together, Lord, Work your glory through us that others might see the good things of God and long to serve Him. We commit these things to you with love and respect and faith in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now I would like this morning... God willing to open the scripture, if you wish to now, to the book of Isaiah. And this being a businessman's meeting, yet their main business is getting souls right with God. That's what they're dedicated to. And we are wanting to speak on the gospel and the sincerity and the approach to it. And let's begin reading now from Isaiah 6, the first chapter, uh, the first verse of Isaiah 6, reading down, including the 8th. And in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried to another, said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the doors moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphs unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send, and who shall go for us? Then said I, Here am I, Send me. I wish to draw from this little text some context on some notes that I have written down here. And if I should give it a title, I would like to call it Influence. You know, there's so many of us, and most all of us, uh, influence somebody by the things that we do and the way we live and the things we say. We influence somebody. Somebody is watching your life. And then when we profess to be Christians, what type of life should we live if somebody is watching us? And your life that you live will reflect an influence on somebody that might, it might be the, their eternal destination will rest upon the way that you live and the things that you do. For they watch him. In our text this morning as influence, we find that this king Uzziah was a, a 
a great influence to Isaiah, the, the young prophet. Isaiah had been called to his side. And being a noted, a vindicated prophet of his day, and he had a, I believe the way that Isaiah spoke it, he was, uh, uh, had a great influence upon Isaiah. Now we find that Uzziah was called to be king at the age of about 16 years old after his father's death. And his father was a, a great believer and he had, his mother also was a very fine woman. And this young king had been um, crowned at a young age and quickly he taken the road that was right because of the influence of a godly father and a godly mother. And I think that's a very fine example for we parent today is to set an example before our children. Now you live your your best and your worst at home. And I think that our lives, though the children might not just exactly act like they're uh, noticing it, but they are noticing it. Don't you never think that they are not because they're watching. Not only the children are watching, but the neighbors are watching. Not only the neighbors are watching, but the uh, all that you are associated with watches. The people at your church watch you. The people that you do business with in the markets, they're watching you after your confession. And we should always try to reflect Christ in everything that we do. I know a little motto that I had hanging in my house many years ago. I picked it up one day when at uh, Billy Sunday's Tabernacle, when is that one of the meetings up at um, Wine on a Lake? And I liked it so much till I, I got it and hung it up in my house. And I kept it until it just fell apart. It was something like this. Go no place you would not be want to be found if Jesus should come. And uh, be saying nothing that you would not want to be saying if Jesus should come. And it went on with many things, saying what you, and otherwise, whatever you do or say or whatever action that you're performing, do not do it if you would not want to be caught in that position when Jesus comes. If we could only do that, I'm sure we'd be a great influence upon our associates. And, you know, the right, there's two ways to do anything that's right and wrong. I had my little son Joseph on my lap the other day, and I said to him, he's eight years old, and some little boy had uh, stepped on his toes, and he and the little boy had a fight. So I said, Joseph, don't, don't do that. He said, but Daddy, he did such and such. I said, but that doesn't matter See, what he did. Just remember, Joseph, that you love your father. He said, yes, Daddy. I said, then remember that people are going to look at your life as a minister's son. And then if you do anything wrong... Then they're going to say, does this minister permit his child to do such? Now, we know they do it anyhow. But uh, we know that as Christians, we know that we try to bring up our children right. But uh, it's a good thing to keep that before them all the time. That do what's right. Don't, don't ever take that other side. So... Uh, I said, because, you see, that doesn't only reflect on you, Joseph, but it reflects on your mother, reflects on your sisters. 
It reflects on your father and the very cause of the family, what we're standing for, and then what we stand for, it reflects on that, on Jesus Christ. You don't want to do that. I said, our, our Lord told us if we're, if somebody smites us on one cheek, just turn the other. And of course, that's kind of hard for a little boy with a high temper to begin with, to, to think of such things, but place it before him anyhow, see, that he should not do it. Now, this young fellow, Yuskai, uh, had such a training in his early days to, when he had taken the throne, he never turned right or left from the thing that was right. He stayed right with it. He never let uh, politics influence him in any way. He was a man who was determined to serve God. Regardless. And so politics didn't ignore all of those things. And another thing that I liked about Uzziah was that he ignored popularity or popular opinions. No matter what anybody else thought or what the popular trend of the day was, he wanted to serve God regardless. Oh, we need man like that. In our uh, political world. We need man like that in the White House. We need man like that in business. We need man like that in the pulpit. Man that will not turn to popular opinions or popularity, but will stay straight with the word. Not turn right or left. God in commission, Joshua said, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. And then thou shalt make thy ways prosperous. Then thou shalt have good success. And not only that, but you're influencing somebody the same way you're traveling. And so I appreciate uh, the stand that Uzziah took to be determined. The first thing he began to do was to repair the house of the Lord and to build up the places that had been torn down and then go out to the enemy after he had proved to God that he was sincere and he, he was going to take the right stand regardless of what his uh, people around him is uh, advisors to influence him to a political side of the of the kingdom, he would not stand for it. He wanted God's will in that alone. That's the kind of man we need. The kind of mothers we need. A woman, a mother of this day that will take the right stand and do what's right regardless of what the other women does. Do what's right. It's such a pity to see our nation in such a scrimmel as it is today. I got up a little late this morning to get to the breakfast. Now, I went to a place and to get some coffee, and there's a little lady come out to serve me. And she had, wife and I were sitting there, and she had her eyes blue, uh, you know, that uh, stuff of her eyes. And... Um, I seen one of those in Los Angeles one time, the first one I ever seen the ladies made up in that way. And I, I, I thought that uh, I was going to walk up and tell her I was a missionary. And I'd seen plaguery and leprosy, and, but I'd never seen anything like that. And I was going to uh, ask her if I could not pray for her. And, uh, and, I, and uh, tell me what kind of a disease she had. And I was a little afraid of it. And I'd never seen anything quite like it. And I, when I walked over, I was waiting for Brother Argenbright and uh, one of the uh, businessmen and the officials. And another girl walked up looked just like her. <laughs> I would say, I, I might be wrong here. That, uh, she might have did that herself. And it was a very attractive 
A girl would have been if she just washed her face and looked like a human. But she was so... Now, when some of these movie stars are somewhere, I don't know where it comes from, when they will do a thing like that, some woman with some kind of an influence, then that influences the rest of the nation to try to do the same. That's right. When our Pentecostal women was allowed to cut their hair because some minister let down in the pulpit, then the rest of them said, well, so-and-so's wife does it, can't we? See, it's the influence that you place up on. Some of them, this little lady this morning was such a nice little lady. She was very sweet and uh, just as respectable as she could be. And when we, she left the table and turned around, my wife looked across the table at me and I said, you know, it's just a pity that some devil, and I'm not reluctant to say devil, that has coped up such a thing to bring our American women under such influence as that heathen traits. Influence. Somebody started it. Well, don't you never go by what some say, somebody of this country, I don't care, or other country, or, or some minister's wife, or somebody else, don't you never be influenced by them. You let the Bible influence you to the thing that's right. And that's wrong. Now, and then we, we shout and dance and speak in tongues and, and uh, uh, the glory of God we claim is on us. And then go out to such as that. There's something wrong. Now, I believe in these things, these uh, shouting and speaking in tongues and dancing in the Spirit. But, brother, how could God uh, tolerate such a thing as that when He's against it? And He says so in His Word. And our women has become in our churches, uh, which is merely practiced many times, dressing sex appeal. It's very seldom ever spoke against from the pulpit. And yet we shout and jump around and speak in tongues. That's the reason that this great move called Pentecostal is not getting any worse because there's no sincerity behind it. It becomes an emotion. And because when I say them things, many say he's a woman hater. He, he's different from... It's not trying to be different. He's trying to be sincere. I believe that we're in the last days. And we got a, a great message. But all of our shouting and speaking in tongues will be of no effect. You can see it among us. You can see that we're growing in numbers. But are we growing in power? We're still on the same grounds that we were when we started 40 years ago, where we should already be over in the promised land. Influence. One minister's wife let down and did this, and one minister started so-and-so, and the rest just started. Oh, may we like uh, the uh, Ezekiah here, that let's not let nothing influence us, but the Word of God. Let that be our influence. Uh, bring ourselves back to the faith, back to the correction of the Scripture, no matter what the rest of the world has to do. And we, brethren, many of the brethren who belong to organization, which practically it's all got little groups, I have nothing against that. That's all right, but when we go in to get the place that we feel that ours is the only group, that we got it and the other fellow hasn't got nothing to do with it, that is being influenced by the higher-ups in the organization, that we should make our organization to grow. We are to make the kingdom grow. We are here to influence. 
And we will never be an influence to the outside world as long as we are trying to influence them to some organization because they've been that before we were born. Let's take the stand for God and His Word and fellowship and get all brethren. Let us not draw a line and say, if you don't toe to this, let's reach a hand across the line. Be brethren. That's the reason I have been so sold on this year. Christian businessmen's full gospel fellowship. That's the reason that Methodists and Presbyterians and so forth, where the ministers could not seem to reach across there. But the businessman broke down those traditions. They're helping doing that thing. Now, if we can just keep it beat out of their heads to organize, which it looks like they're headed that way, and when they do, that's me out. <laughs> because I'm here to stand for what is true. <laughs> never want that. That's the thing that very... I wish to speak on one of these nights. Samson standing in that same place. <laughs> so, uh, uh, somewhere along the line. Now, let's watch what our influence is. Now, we see... Uh, uh, Uzziah here, he was a great man. And we find out because that he took those terrific stands that he did, that, you know, his kingdom was next to Solomon's. He spread out. Even all the countries around about uh, loved him, and, and they paid tribute to his kingdom. And we find out that even way down in Egypt, his influence was felt. And this being the way he stood in this young prophet standing there before the king, he, it was a great influence to Isaiah. How that God would bless any man that would be true to his word, regardless of what his politics tried to influence him to, regardless of what anything else tried to be. Hezekiah was determined to stay with the word. And God blessed him. And Isaiah saw it. But, as usual, just like a group of people, just like the remark that I said about the businessman, when Uzziah began to feel secure, and he had just about got everything in the kingdom that God had for him, he got lifted up in his heart. Now, that's what's happened to our denominations all through the ages. When they feel like they're big enough to say, now, we're that. Then they get lifted up, and that's when God leaves them. And if the businessman gets to that spot, where we have, as Brother William said, 15, but God can do more with 15 in his hand than he could with 1,500 out of his hand. That's right. See? But we appreciate 1,500 in his hand instead of 15 in his hand. If they'll all stay in his hand. That's the main thing. Being influenced not by what great numbers we are, but by what a great God that we're representing. And the kind of life that is in us by him that will influence others. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its Savior, it is henceforth good for nothing. Cast out, trod on the feet of man. We must never forget that. We are salt, but if its salt loses its strength, that's its, its power to contact. And salt can only save as it contacts. And if it loses its power of contact, then it is no more salt, but it's sand. It's to be made walks. And when we lose our influence as a father, as a mother, as a Christian, as a businessman, as a minister, when we lose our influence with people, now we can be very popular in the line of the world and go wrong with the world, but I mean as what we represent. We represent Christ. When we lose our influence as that, 
They're standing out. How can we blend in with the day when God's so against the day? How can Micah say, go on up and prosper? My vision's right with yours. When he know that God had cursed that evil people. His vision had to be contrary. And a man's vision today that could go with the trend of the world and still remain a minister, there's something wrong with the man's vision. You know what God said about this rich lady we'll see in church? Put him on the outside. We cannot stand with the popular belief and vote of the day. We've got to be against that thing. Now, so it, this king got along fine until he found out that all the nations were fearing him. He became largely uh, populated. His kingdom got built up and he got lifted up in his heart with pride. You see, we're just, I'm just a big man now. And that's the way out. The way up is down. How do you know which is up or down? <laughs> because if the world stands in space, how do you know which is up or down? So always he that humbles himself, God will exalt. He that exalts himself, God will bring to a base. He'll bring him down. Always keep humble and be little in your own sight. No matter what God does for you, just see how much more humbler you can be all the time. More God blesses you, just keep getting more humble all the time. He can continue to bless. But when you get to a place you think, I got it, you haven't got it, you're on your road out. That's right. You lose your influence. You lose the, the strength of your testimony. When you women begin to uh, want to be like the rest of women, there's something wrong. When you man, you ministers, be trying to become like a uh, pattern actor somebody else. When you businessmen, trying to do business on the scale that somebody else would do it on because they're prosperous. Prosperity don't always represent success in Christ. Sometimes very much to the contrary. Now, pride he got lifted up. And he thought, what a great fella I am. So much he got lifted up till he tried to take the place of a minister. He goes into the temple, which picked up the censer of fire and went up to the altar of incense. Now, that was only consecrated man could do that. Now, as I have said before, so say it again. Businessmen are not preachers. We preachers have enough time to try to keep this thing straight, let alone businessmen. You all are businessmen, not ministers. And don't take the place of one or try to because you're not called for such. If you want somebody to speak at your conventions, get a preacher. Somebody's called to do so. Because you see what a struggle us ministers has got. And so, you see what you do? And uh, as a Kai here, he tried to, to take the place of a priest. He thought, well, God's blessed me. Why can't I do it? Don't you never get that in your head. God calls and predestinates and foreordains to His glory. Amen. Nothing. You remember in the Bible when Moses was bringing Israel out of Egypt across to the, to the promised land? Do you remember one in there, Dathan, and those who got lifted up and said, now wait a minute, Moses, you try to be the only one on the beach. There's other holy man among here and God said, separate yourself because I will destroy him. God had ordained a certain thing to be done and it must be done that way. We're not to inject our own ideas. We're to respect His idea and His command. Now, not referring back to our sisters, but at the no matter what the other woman does, God's got your pattern laid here. No matter what uh, some other layman done in the Bible, God's got your pattern here what to do. We'll get to it 
after a while, perhaps, what the layman is to do. And the minister. All of us has our places, and we must abide in our calling. Now, we find out that this man got lifted up, so he uh, uh, took the censer and went forth to the altar, which was only permitted by God to consecrate a man to that office. He tried to take the minister's place. And then the minister tried to correct him. We find out that four score priests besides the high priest come after him and told him, Sir, in other words like this, God has blessed you. You're an honored man. You're a great man. And God has blessed you in your work. But you, you shouldn't do that. You're getting off of the beaten road. Oh, how I could say some things here. Um, yes, getting off the beaten road. But uh, be it the thing is the way it is, let's try to conserve what we can get a hold of. See? Uh, he said, you're off the track. For the Word of God says so and so. Only Aaron's generation shall do this. That's for Aaron and him alone. And his children. So, King, we honor you. We respect you. You're a great man. But don't try to do that. And did, was he humble? No, sir. He thought, God's blessed me, so I'll just do what I want to. Now, watch, my brethren. Be careful there. Because no matter how much God has filled you with His Spirit, and how much that you have done and how well you've been blessed, you stay with the calling of God. Don't get off on some traditions and organizational schemes and so forth. You better come back to the path. You better come back to what God laid down at the beginning. Now, so we find out that this man, when he was corrected, instead of humbling himself and admitting that the Word was right and God was right, he become angry. Hey, in other words, uh, uh, he was ready to kick him out of his organization. <laughs> he, was, uh, he was very upset about it, uh, very perplexed. and oh, He got angry and he had to turn around and say, Now, you just wait a minute. Do you realize who I am? Now, when you're corrected by the Word of God, you must be subject to the Word. And he said, uh, he would do as he pleased. He was the head of the thing, so he'd, he'd just do as he wanted to. And you know what happened? He was smitten with leprosy. And while his anger rage was upon him, the priest detected the leprosy in his face. Now, you say, well, what you mean leprosy represents is, is a type, rather, of sin. And when a man won't stand correction by the Word of God, he's full of leprosy. Blows up and carries on. What, does you, what do you do? You ruin your influence. See? Something happens. People know and can tell the Word that you're corrected by that you're not going to do it. Therefore, you ruin your influence. And it hurt this fellow. Anger got on him. And while he was in his anger, leprosy was in his face. And we find out that he not only did he drop the censer, but he ran from the house of God to never be able to return again. Because no matter how great he was and how much influence he had had, he, when he was corrected... Then he refused to take his correction because his social standing had become more to him than the Word of God had become. I'm sure you understand what I'm driving at. See? It become more to him, his position as king become more to him than the Word of God. When this businessman's organization gets to that place, when the minister of his organization gets to that place, then he's done. Don't faint when you're rebuked. 
When you read something in the Scripture and you know that you should humble yourself and follow the Word of God in the path that He ordained for you walking, then you don't do it. Then first thing you know, it's over. Your influence is spoiled. Now we must remember that. And this young prophet, what a lesson that was to him then when he seen this king. By this very thing, Isaiah learned one of his greatest lessons. That no matter how great a man might be, how much influence he might have, but when he fails to walk in light, when he fails to obey God, then his influence is ruined and he's tucked off the field. Another thing Isaiah learned, he learned by this that God orders his man to his place. Not you putting yourself in that place, but God puts His man in place. We must recognize that. I've often used this. Uh, I like to hunt, as you know. And up in the north, when, when the winter starts coming in, little ducks is born up there on the ponds. And as soon as that first cold breeze uh, tops the mountains and a few flakes of snow falls, now that little duck was born in the spring up on that lake. And he never was off the lake. He knows nothing about anything else but that lake. But just as sure as that breeze blows, and he feels that breeze blow, he runs right out in the middle of that, swims out there and raises a little nose up there and honks a few times, and every duck on the pond will come right to him. And he'll raise up with that instinct in him, knowing that soon that pond's going to be froze over our lake. And he'll go just as straight to Louisiana as he can go. He will. Why? There's something in him. It's a God-given instinct and he uses it. It guides him. Now, what does it do? What if he went a... If that instinct led him farther north, then he would know there was something wrong. And those ducks wouldn't follow him. Because he's going contrary to the regular path. And when we get ourselves to a place that we try to lead people contrary, they say, well, we the Methodists has got it. We the Baptists has got it. That isn't it. God's got it. Amen. That's right. And in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word still is God. So it's God that's got it. So let's lead that way, down the beaten path, and not try to lead some other way. And then we find out that this little duck, being that he was, now the rest of the ducks seem to have any, uh, anything but amen, because there's something about that little fellow that they knew the way that hump, that bugle that he blowed. They, they knew that he had the truth. And there's something about the gospel for the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Praise God. Paul said, if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who will know how to prepare himself for a battle? Now, but when the gospel gives a sound, Jesus Christ is saying yesterday and forever. And we watch it and see that it's the truth. And it's with the Word. That's the thing that influences a real duck. Now there's others on the pond like water guineas and so forth. They have another way. Mud hens and all such. But they stay their own way. But the real duck goes on. God placed that little duck there and give him that because God placed him to be that. And now God has set in the church... God, not the organization, not the achievement of man to make bishops and so forth, presbyters, but God set in the church first apostles, that's missionaries, secondarily prophets, teachers, pastors, evangelists. God set them in the church and every bugle will blow the same, the same gospel. If he's a prophet, he blows the bugle of prophet. He foretells the things that is to come and hits every time. Now, a little girl come to me the other day. She may be sitting present now and she said, Brother Branham, uh, I gave you a dream. 
And I, in this dream, I, I had a certain thing I, I want you to tell me. Now, sit down. Now, if there's any out in here outside of Pentecostal rims, let me excuse myself to you a moment. And she said, you never told me my dream. I said, honey, sit down just a minute. And I said, your father and mother are very good friends of mine. Retired farmers who came from a long ways to sojourn with us. And I said, they, they believe me as a servant of Christ. You're just a child, about 12 years old. I think she goes to school with my Becky. And I said, look, you're going to meet a lot of things out here, honey, in the name of Christianity. And I said, when you find a man that's got every interpretation just like this, got every uh, this like that in the name of the Lord, I said, you be careful about that. That's contrary to the Scripture. Jesus said there was many lepers in the days of Elijah, but only one was sent to him. One. Many widows in the days of Elisha, but only one was he sent to. Many things that Jesus did not do many times, those gimmicks that's got ever answer, be careful. And when somebody stands up and speaks in the name of the Lord, that must be true. It must be exactly the truth. You might in your mind be impressed. I said, now honey, I believe I could tell you what I think your dream is, but to tell you in the name of the Lord, no, sir. Because she knows the things. I said, have I ever spoke to you in the name of the Lord for what had happened? I said, thousands has come and said this, that. I said, I cannot tell you what your dream is till I see it over again. And then he tells me. Then I say, the Lord told me. Until then, I don't know. I don't want to take my own influence and my own opinions. I can't say, thus saith the Lord, because that's me thinking it. That's the best of my opinion. We must be sincere because we've got the greatest thing in the world. The greatest treasure of heaven is Christ among us. Why do we want to substitute to some little influence to try to make ourselves somebody big among somebody here? Why not be a humble servant to Christ? And I said, that's the reason I can tell you about the Bible. I said, if I told you I was going to Arizona, I suppose your mother and father is going along to the businessman's convention, said they are. I said, what if I told you the first night, I told you now in the name of the Lord, that there would be a, a woman coming crippled and it should be such a way as you've heard it said. And then that woman has been crippled for so many years, immediately after prayer, she'll get up and walk away. I said, what if I would tell you then in the middle of the meeting, a lady had a waterhead baby. And as soon as we prayed, the baby's head was going normal. And at the end of the meeting, there would be four men bearing a dead man that had been dead for so many days. They had brought him. They were wearing dark suits and describe them. And as soon as I asked our Heavenly Father, His Spirit would return to Him. And I said, what you know, it has taken place. Now, I said, then I'd say, your little brother. He's a little five-year-old cotton. I said, what if he gets killed on the street? And he's going to get killed. And you're going to bring him to me, and I'll be standing by a, a doorstep where there's a man with a light suit on. I'll be speaking to him. And your little brother is going to be made whole. Now, I said, then, if that taken place, what if you went out there then, and that woman, arthritic or whatever it was, paralyzed woman, wasn't there? What if the waterhead baby wasn't there? Then you're all mixed up in your mind. You don't know, and I spoke to you and told you, thus saith the Lord. I said, then my influence is lost. You might need me sometime real bad. I said, but what if the woman is there? What if the waterhead baby is here? What if the man is raised from the dead? Then your little brother gets killed. You wouldn't even cry. You'd say, Daddy, let me have him. I'm going to show you the glory of God. Why? It was right here. It was right there. It was right there. It was right there. Every time it's right. Then you know it's right. I said, that's the reason we want to believe the Word of God. In the Garden of Eden, it was spoke of a Messiah to come for a Savior. The prophets foresaw it. He came just exactly the way the Bible said. Nebuchadnezzar dreamed a dream and Daniel interpreted him of the kingdoms of the Gentiles perfectly every time. And everything the Bible has ever spoke of. The Bible says it here, history says it happened. The Bible said here, history says it happened. Now we're at the time of the rapture. 
It's going to happen because it's been perfect every other time. It's got to be perfect this time. God is calling out a people. And it's a time. we got to be sincere. The Lord. Now you've got something, but be careful with it. You'll ruin your influence if that thing doesn't come to pass. You know what I mean? Or you say, I I don't care where you belong, brother, sister. It's got to happen exactly the way you said it. If it isn't, you've only made yourself a laughing stock. You've only brought disgrace upon yourself, ruined your influence, and ruined the testimony of Jesus Christ that you're bearing. Be careful. Now you're doctoring on them things. You're all right. But it goes by promise and under conditions. So be careful about your influence. Here, God. Sometimes we find that someone spoke in tongues. The other wants to imitate him. You speak in tongues too. One sees one given interpretation. They say, I got it too. And you go by impressions. And then say, thus saith the Lord. Well, that's wrong. And God will never move you any further than what you are right now, just an organization, until you get out of that. Now, you might not like me now, but at the day of the judgment, you love me. <laughs> Be sure. Don't you say it unless God says so, and you know that it is the truth that God said so. Not your opinion, but not some impression, because you can be impressed anyway. Those prophets down there, when Jehoshaphat and, and Ahab were sitting in the gates, them men were sincere, and they were inspired. But you see, their inspiration didn't cope with the promise of the Bible. Because the prophet Isaiah, I uh, beg your pardon, uh, the prophet... Um, and prophesied before them Elisha, Elijah and cursed Ahab and Jezebel and said what would happen to him. So how could this blessing be on what God had cursed? And how can the blessing be upon people that's doing and acting the way God said not to do? Though we dance in the Spirit, though we speak with tongues like men and angels and have not charity, it becomes as a sounding brass to people in sin. Now, you've got truth, but you've got to come to it different than just a, a big hilarity. You know what I mean? Just something to be hollering about. And I believe in hollering about it. You've got something to holler about, but be sure you approach that with the very depths of sincerity. If you live a different life than what you should live, keep still until you get that life just to living in you. Then automatically. Do you know the sheep isn't asked to manufacture wool? No, he can't manufacture it. These gifts cannot be manufactured by emotion. This church cannot be manufactured by organization. A sheep bears wool because he is a sheep. He can't help bearing wool. For his whole system's made up to bear wool. We must be what we are inside, not something outside. How can we know what's right and then speak something contrary? Did not Jesus say, you hypocrites? How can you say good things? When out of the abundance of the heart speak of the mouth. Then we must be sure that when we speak these things that they're correct. Now, to hurry up, and I must hurry because I guess I'm too late now. Will you bear with me just a minute longer? Sure, sure. Yes, Isaiah learned right here, no matter how great the organization was, how great the man was, oh God, to give him thousands and millions of dollars of this uh, age that we're living in, that meant not one thing before God. His word was, it, his word is his ultimate. And that settles it. You must keep his word. Humble yourself with it. Notice. Then we find out that he had done something contrary to the word. And he was cursed by it. No matter how great he was, how great David was, a man after God's own heart, yet got away from the word, thou shalt not commit adultery. But David is lifted up. He thought, well, God don't pay no attention to this. God pays attention to every thought that you think of. Let your thoughts be exactly right. What was the matter? Now, it's because that he forgot it. He, for, he went away from it. 
never forgot it because he was told better. Now, God puts his man in a place and he will not accept another. There's no one can take the other man's place. A brother Green here a few moments ago. <laughs> that music, I, I long time since I heard Brother Green. And it was really, it thrilled my heart. A good man. But I was reading the days of Mrs. McPherson. When I seen uh, some of the things that went on, Mrs. McPherson was a was an influential woman. But I noticed that every lady minister uh, had to carry a Bible this way, Mrs. McPherson. Oh my! And we we find the same thing says ten thousand Billy Grahams today. Did you ever notice them try to talk just like him? You be what you are. Stay what you are. You can't be Billy Graham, and Billy Graham can't be you. Your place is just as important as Billy Graham. If you're working for the popularity of the world, you might try to impersonate. You'll get nowhere in the kingdom of God. I'd rather be a doormat at the house of God. Stay with what you are, what God made you. Oh, how we could stay. Well, the reason they do that is because they're not conscious that God's watching. See? You lose the very thought of God being there listening at you. God's putting down everything you're thinking about. And He knows it in His recording book. Your thoughts are louder than heaven and your voice is on the earth. Think the right thing. As I said to little Joseph, I said, um, a little boy is born in this world. He stands right in the middle of a road. And he's pointed to Calvary, to Christ. There's a tree on either side of the road. A one on the left side, which I'll call the wrong. If he just starts smacking little boys in the face because they smacked him. And if they start doing these things, it pulls that little boy with the influence and it makes him crooked. But if he takes this other side of the road, which is the Holy Spirit, he points him straight to Calvary and keeps him that way. It makes you grow straight. Your thoughts, it's just as easy to think good thoughts as it is to think bad. Just as easy to think good of those who speak evil of you as it is vice versa. And a lot better than make you grow straight. Okay, stay straight with God. Now, to hurry up. The vision at the temple... He saw God upon his throne lifted up. Oh, note the heavenly seraphims, uh, which means burners, a uh, special designed person. When this uh, Isaiah went down to the temple, he had been leaning upon the shoulder of, of uh, as Kai. And wherever the king went, he but he found out that when the king, no matter how influenced he had been, influentially had been to him. And of the things that he had done that was great, he found out that when he tried to take another's place, he failed. We have so much today of carnal impersonations. What does it do? Let, uh, let me take... Uh, uh, notice, today, God sends something on the earth. And when we do, what happens? Everybody has to be the same. Not long ago, they brought a little Pentecostal boy up by the name of little David Walker. And that little boy was a preacher. I've heard a little boy saying, uh, little baby Jesus born into me. Mama, what was that next? See, but not that little boy. I went to hear him. He threw off his coat and took a text and handled it like a clergyman. But I believe he belonged to the oneness group. Well, now the Trinity group ain't going to stand, stand up for that. I'll tell you that. So they got them a little David. And when the little boy got down in Florida, he called me to come down there and help him. And I took the front page of the paper and they had to put an extra section in it for the little Davids. A little boy, little girls, little baby, three-year-old, two-year-old, everybody trying to hold their little group together. It seems to me like it become a Pentecostal meal ticket. <laughs> if all of them brothers would have got around that little boy and kept him prayed over him and things that he wouldn't get exalted up and a hell. Send him into all the groups and make him keep his, his doctrine to himself, but just go ahead and preach it for all, you know, one tens of thousands of little children. Amen. But they got little impersonations up in the outside world, come in here, they heard of a little David, and here's one greater than little David. So they come around and look at it and say, well, they go over there and see a total flop. So then they go back and say, there you are. When they hear somebody speak in tongues and give an interpretation, say, the Lord's going to do a certain thing and see it happen just like that. Then they go to another and see just a bunch of carnal impersonations come back. They go around and say, you're all mad. See, it's carnal comparisons. Don't do that. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. 
Let me humble my pride and just call on His name. Let me wait, Lord. If He never do no more for me and save me, that's what I want. If you have need for me, show me. And that's what I'll know and then I'll go. But you tell me first. I'm here, your servant. Do that. And your influence will be great. Notice. God is all holy. This prophet had been leaning upon uh, this uh, king's arms, but when he found out that something taking place, no matter how much a, a man was blessed, yet when God, he steps across that boundary line between error and truth, God calls his hand. Then Isaiah went down to the temple, and he fell down on his knees. No doubt he had said, Yes, honorable king, your holiness, sir, and so forth, but it, it was, uh, or your majesty, sir, it would have been different. Now, he fell down on the temple, on the altar, and began to cry out. And as he cried, God came down in a vision, and he saw angels going back and forth through the temple. Wings over their feet and wings over their face, flying, crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And he said, I saw God lifted up, way up. Above any man here on earth. Above a Solomon or a David or Ezekiah. God was lifted to a place that man cannot come. Then he become influenced of another way. He saw God lifted up high, way up. And his train. And when he saw those mighty beings, the place was filled with smoke. And he looked at the pillars of the temple. The posts began to shake at their voice. He never saw that by... Hezekiah, he saw that a mortal man can fall. No matter how much he's blessed, he can still fall. But he looked at one that can fall, whose foundations is sure. Even the pillars of the temple moved at their voices. Think of it. Two wings that covered their faces. Think even angels cover their holy faces. Those seraphims, they're next to cherubims. They are the same as cherubims. They're the burners of the sacrifice. And that's making the, the children, the worshippers, way in, assuring them the way. And these seraphims who stay in the presence of God have to cover their faces. Then we just take the name of God and use it anyway. Prophesy in it when it means nothing but some kind of carnal influence and so forth and say things that never happen and act like you never pay any attention. If you say something and honestly and it didn't happen, repent and tell it that you were wrong. Then your influence will come back. The man's honest. These angels, seraphims, never know sin or nothing about sin. They just burn the sacrifice to make a way of the worshiper, the saints. And they have to have their faces covered. What would that be upside of Hezekiah? Cover their holy faces in the presence of God with reverence. Now there's no reverence. There seems to be that we can just do anything in the name of the Lord and get by with it. Just as long as we belong to some certain group that got a good social standing and they don't take our papers away from us, the presbyters and the bishops and so forth don't call our papers and we still have a good influence amongst the people. Well, what kind of an influence do we have in the presence of God? Does our prayers return by or are they answered? If you abide me in my word and you ask what you will and it shall be done. He that believeth in me the works that I do shall he do also. Even more than this shall he do for I go to the Father. Where are we Pentecostal people? Find ourselves on the road map this morning. Let's not get bypassed. No, sir, there's one road to heaven. And that's the road of holiness. The righteous walk in it. The unbeliever laughs at it. Depends on what you are. Now, the people don't have reverence. And those who try to live right... Some of them ought to be respecting that stand that the man is tucked or the woman is tucked. Laugh at him. A man the other day caused a woman had her hair pulled back and made a bun on the back, took Isaiah 5 and said, cut that hair off. Said because it said they're round tires. Any man that knows more about the Word of God than that, when the Word of God said it's a disgrace, a shame, a dishonorable thing for a woman to cut her hair. Amen. Said, deflate your spare tar. You're going to come to this church. And women laughing at her because... There you are. No reverence. Don't know the Word. Amen. Don't respect it when it is told them. 
ministers see the Word of God and refuse to walk in it. Reminds me, coming down, I had a, one of these here cameras, and uh, it's, uh, it's kind of a new thing to me. Billy works at Right Smart, and it's got one of these here range finders, that's what it is. And I looked through something, I seen three or four objects. And they all looked a whole lot alike. I said, that can't be so. I looked this way, and I only see one. And I looked this way, and I seen three or four. I got a hold of this little thing and focused it until it come into one. That's what the church needs. A range finder. Use your range finder. What is it? Here it is. Well, whosoever will take one word from it or add one word to it, the same will be taking his part out of the book of life. Your range finder. You got three or four, don't know what to do with it? Pull it down into one. God is one. His word is one. His people are one. Not 50, 666 organizations. They're one. Just one. That day you know what I am in the Father and Father in me, I and you and you and me. Right? Take your range finder. Pull it in. No reverence. So people try to do right. Man, take a stand for the Word of God and say, I'm going to have my congregation cleaned up. The first thing you know, a complaint comes in from somebody else and they oust him. He has got out on the street. <laughs> Why? They're not convinced of his presence. You ought to do like David said. Put the Lord always before my face. And I shall not be moved. Let the Lord be before me. I'll have him on my right hand. Uh, he'll be before my face. Wherever I see, I want to see Jesus in it. I'll go no place. I'll do nothing. My influence, just let it be for him. Then your range finder has found the truth. For if the life of Christ, let the mind that was in Christ be in you. And he always was about the Father's Word to do his business. So which one of you can accuse me of sin, unbelief? Everything the Bible said that I would do, I proved it. God's proved it through me that I am the Messiah. Which one of you can accuse me of sin? Until you can do the things that I do and make the Word proved by you that the Word's proved by me, then keep still because sin is unbelief in the Word of God. He that believeth not is condemned already. Oh, where we're standing, church. Where is it at? Now, they had two wings over their feet. What was that? Humility in his presence. Moses took off his shoes in the presence of God. Paul fell down to the ground to kiss the ground as it was. He was in the presence of God. John the Baptist said, I'm not even worthy to loose the shoes on his feet. Wings over their feet. Humility. Watching where they walk. What they do. Realizing their own holy ground. Oh, if we would do that, we'd never walk into these places that's wrong. We'd never do these things and that's wrong. Now notice, always listen. Be conscious of your littleness. Who are you? Stick your finger in a bucket of water and pull it out and find the hole you put your finger in. Then say, that was me. <laughs> you're a nothing. You'll not be missed a little while after you're gone. They have a funeral procession out here and that's all. But your influence yeah. will live on and on and on. That's why today in the midst of infidels, they've never been able to explain and get away from the influence of one man, Jesus Christ, who was God made flesh. Amen. When he stuck his life down here on earth, it made a suction of a place that draws all man unto him in the great whirlpool of his life that was once on earth. You can't get near it without being drawn into it. But you and I, we're nothing. We're nothing. Let's think what's drawing us. I'm my little boat up on the sea of time don't mean nothing, but that great thing is drawing me. It's what I'm trying to point to. This is it. Oh, that's good. Be conscious of your littlest. Thirdly, let's think. He, with two wings he had over his face in the presence of God, humility, and our, our reverence. And secondly, he had two wings over his feet. What was it? In humility. And third, he flew with them. Hallelujah. Put himself in action. He, he put himself in action with two wings. Well, two more wings covered his face in reverence. Two wings covered his feet in humility. And two wings he was in action. What was he doing? He was showing the prophet. By this he was showing the prophet how his prepared servants must be. God prepared servants. 
must be reverent, humble, and in action. <laughs> but now if you uncover your face, uncover your feet, your action isn't going to do no good because you're stirred wrong. <laughs> takes it all to guide you. Reverent, humble, and in action. That's what God wants this Pentecostal group to be. That's what God wants His church to be. In action. Like the woman at the well. As soon as she stood there and looked upon this Jew that was speaking to her. And he said, woman, bring me a drink. And she said, well, the, the, the well is deep. And said, you have nothing to draw with them. By the way, first said, uh, we have no dealings with one another. You know this segregation here? Well, we don't have any dealings. You're, I'm a woman of Samaria. And, and you're a Jew. We don't have anything. See? She went with the old trend. But he said to her, if you knew who you were talking to, or who was talking to you, you'd ask me for a drink. She said, the well's deep. You have nothing to draw with. He said, go get your husband and come here. Well, she said, I have no husband. He said, you told the truth. You've had five. And the one you're living with now is not your husband. Look, quickly! She backed off. What was it? Not like the Pharisees when they seen that did. They said, this man's Beelzebub, a fortune teller. He has mental telepathy. We'll have nothing to do. We'll explain it all the way to our congregation. After all, he don't know the word. We come out of school. We have no record of him ever coming out of our seminaries. <laughs> but he had truth. Vindicated, God-given truth. What happened? Her wings quickly went over her face. The wings went over her feet. She said, Sir, not Beelzebub, Sir, the best I know, you must be a prophet. Now, I know we haven't had a prophet for hundreds of years. But the Scripture says that when the Messiah comes, he'll be a prophet like Moses. And we know when Messiah comes, he'll do these things. But I don't understand who are you. You must be a prophet. When this Messiah comes, he's going to do the same thing that you did because he'll be the God prophet. He said, I'm he that speaks to you. Then she went in action. <laughs> come see a man. Amen. What did he do today? What did he say today? He don't belong to our organization. <laughs> no reverence, no humility. To join up with our groups. When they see a church rise up like that, it's, it's a Pentecostal rank. Look where it come from. Birds of a feather. That's good. Doves always are together. So he finally said, certainly, they eat dove food too. Not crow food. <laughs> a crow's a hypocrite. He can eat dove food and be a vulture at the same time. But a dove can't eat crow food. <laughs> he has got no gall. <laughs> right. He'd eat a kill him. But the old crow can sit down and eat a mess of... of of his own scavenger appetite, fill it and go right out and eat corn with the dove. But ah, uh, can't do that with the dove. He can only eat his own food. And a real dove of God only eats the Word. He can't take the things of the world. No, sir. He can't stomach it. It's all to kill him. So he just can't stand it. But they all sat on the same roost. And that's, they did it in the ark and they've done it ever since. So there you are. Jesus said, let them alone. So that, that day the wheat will be taken to the garner and so forth. Now, I'm holding you long, but I, I hurry if I can. Notice, just quick, I don't mean to say it any, you know, this is not a joking paraphrase. This is Scripture, see? Humble. The woman went in action. Why? First, she revered. Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Wings over feet, over face. She recognized him. You are a prophet. I believe that. We know when Messiah come. Now, we haven't had a prophet since Malachi. But we are taught down here that someday there will rise one on the scene among the Jews. And he will be the Messiah. And Moses said, the one that we're told, if there be a man among you who's spiritual or a prophet, and what this man says comes to pass, then you know it. That's just the same thing that Jeremiah said to, to Hannah and so forth. If this comes to pass, then we know it's vindicated. That's the truth. And now here you tell me that I have five husbands, and that's the truth, and I'm living with another man now. So I know that you must be a prophet. I know it's time for the Messiah to come. And he'll tell us those things. And he said, I'm he. And as soon as he identified himself, she went in action. Right down to the city and said, come see a man who told me the things I've done. Isn't this the very Messiah? Don't miss it, man. He's setting out there on the stump. Hallelujah. Oh, could I say this morning, that same Messiah in the form of the Holy Ghost is right here Amen. now. Don't miss it, church. 
showing the same signs and same things. The works that I do shall you do also. Same signs. It has to be. If a life is in a grapevine, uh, growing, if, if you could transfer the life of a pumpkin into a grapevine, why, well, it would grow a pumpkin. Or watermelon, whatever life is in it. And if the life of Christ has been transferred into you by the Holy Spirit, you bear the fruit. You live the life. So you see, if we're bearing pumpkins over here, it should be bearing grapes. There's something wrong. See, so get that life out of you. You don't have to take that. The transfusion's open this morning. There is a fountain filled with blood. Drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Where sinners plunge beneath the flood. Impersonators can plunge there and lose all their impersonation. You get something that's real. And then your influence will be greatly among the people in the presence of God. The woman went in action. Peter, one day he was a little in doubt, maybe. He loaned his boat to a Galilean man that was pretty well uh, down in the low bracket amongst the people. As a Beelzebub, a fortune teller, some evil spirit was up on him. We know that thou art a Samaritan and mad. We know you have a devil. And all the churches that ousted him out. And yet he was just as straight with the word as could be. Dare he if you say he wasn't. That's right. Don't say he wasn't. He was all contrary to any of their beliefs. But he had exactly the word. Could prove it right in the scripture. He said, who can accuse me of sin? Now, he had it. And when Peter loaned him the boat, he said, cast out into the deep and let down for the draw. He said, I fished all night. There ain't nothing out there. So I said, cast out into the deep. Well, if this man is the Messiah, he's prophet. So I'll pull the boat out here. And he threw the net over. And he said, at your word, I'll take it because I don't know you, but your, your, your speech sound all right. So I'll throw the net out and see. And I throw the net out. And when it went down, he said, depart from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. Amen. Same thing that Isaiah had to say. Amen. Depart from me, Lord. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell among unclean people. He found out that the word of God worked when you take God at his word. The blind man, when he was healed, he couldn't hold his peace. Why? He is in action. Peter went in action. The woman went in action. The blind man, he couldn't hold his peace. He said, is this man a... Give glory to God. We know this man's a sinner. So it's a strange thing that you all don't know who he is and being leaders. It's a strange thing the day has arrived on us that a man could open the eyes of a blind man and you clergymen don't know who he is. That man has some good... Theology. <laughs> so that's a strange thing among you people who are supposed to be the spiritual leaders of the day. And a man's eyes has been open here. Me being blind, you know I'm blind. You know I was blind and now I can see. So whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But I do know one thing. I can see where I was blind before. He went in action. It covered his face. Covered his feet. He said, Lord, who is this that I might worship? Man, he wanted to know. The blind man. Sure, he scattered his fame abroad everywhere. Listen. The people of Pentecost. They covered their feet. They covered their faces. They didn't care what the Jews said. They had a commission from God, a word of God, to go up to the temple, to Jerusalem, and wait up there at Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit came. And there they were, obeying His word. Humility, bowing when the church is laughing at him. A bunch of heretics is in the upper room up there. Faith is covered in the presence of God. Oh, Lord, you gave the promise. If there's any evil in me, cleanse me, Lord. All at once, there came down wings of action, and they went into action. They who were scared wouldn't give a testimony out on the street. They were in the street speaking with other tongues and, and in action, insomuch that the people said, These men are full of new wine. And then Peter, the one who could keep the scripture, scripture straight, said, These are not full of new wine, but this is that. And I've always said, if this isn't that, I'll just keep this till that comes. So I, I like this so well, I'll just stay with this until that gets here. I believe this is that. All right, yeah. They seen God's promise fulfilled. It put them in action. And what we have seen, what we have seen, these promises in these last days, what we have seen ourselves ought to put each one of us in action. But you know why? We don't cover our faces and our feet right. Our wings won't work. See, we got these wings spread out and these wings spread out and trying to spread these two. We're just fanning air. <laughs> cover yourself. Humble yourself. Then get in action. 
Oh, my. What we've seen happen should put every soul in action. It should make a church that would make a revival here in Phoenix that people would be flying in from Europe to see what's taking place. They'd say there's a place in Arizona called the Maricopa Valley, a city called Phoenix. There's something broke out there until the seven thunders of Revelation 10 is not even wrote in the Bible is being manifested. The power of God, the end time is here. The angel has given up the loose ends and we're here. Amen. He's about to write those thunders. And he said, don't write them. Seal them up. And at that day of the sounding of this last seventh angel, seventh church age, the lady of sin church age, the mystery of God, all about God, how God's not a big bunch of gods, but one God. And all these other things should all be finished. And time the great battles back before, it's got the loose ends hanging out. It ought to be all wrapped up together. And this last age said, then when that sound... An angel come down and said, Time shall be no more. I'll swear by him that lives forever and ever, time shall be no more. Oh, we are here, brother, sister. We're at the time. Let's let the Holy Spirit influence us to the Word of God. Let's let God do the influencing in our hearts and not be influenced by others. See, this ought to put us in action with reverence and humility. The pillar of fire vindicated among us again, like it was bring the children of Israel. Signs of his coming is at hand. Oh, my, the Word, by the Word being fulfilled, we see the promise the last days he pour out his Spirit. Look at the Presbyterian, Methodist, and Baptist. They're coming into this move. Did you know that? Listen, brethren, do you not understand the Scriptures? The Bible said when the sleeping virgin come to buy oil, that was the time that the bridegroom came. I notice in your full gospel business, man, how you bring in Father so-and-so, the Presbyterian. You bring in Father so-and-so, the Catholic, and all of this. By the way, they're not fathers. The Bible said, call no man father, only sir. They're ministers. And I respect them in every respect that can be respected, but you're not to call them father. And you businessman, I hope that editor's here this morning. How comes you write a declaration on the back of what your creeds are and things like that and be interdenomination? You better get out of that. <laughs> All right. Notice, my brethren. Listen. When the bridegroom came, the sleeping virgin woke and the, the sound come. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Is that the day we're living in? And the sleeping virgin rose. And the Methodist and Presbyterian, Catholic, no. Come in. Oh, oh, give us some of this oil. We see it. He said, we just got enough for ourselves. Now you have to carry for it yourself. And while they were carrying, the bride come. And never in the history of the church age, never in the history of the Pentecostal realm in these last 50 years has ever been a time that the denominational world is sweeping in like it is right now. Don't you realize that this is the last call? That's That's it. And yet we just haphazardly go on like it wasn't even nothing happened. Glory to God, I can dance in the Spirit. And I... oh, my. Jesus said, many will come to me in that day. Say, Lord, Lord, have not done these things. Sincerity, your influence. My. Yes, what we've seen come to pass should put us in action. We like the prophet, Isaiah. We have seen the self-exalted denominations lose their place. What happened when the revival come with Luther? What did they do? Just a little while and they organized. Made a Lutheran organization. Draw a little line and said, we're Lutherans, the rest of you's out. God broke it up with John Wesley. And then when John Wesley left, Charles and John and Asbury and so forth, when they left off the scene, they organized it. What did you do? Draw the same line like the Catholic Church did. Made an organization. There was an organization to the Catholic Church. It's the mother of all of it. Now you that know history know that's true. The Nicaea Council. Now, we find out uh, there you organized. What did you do? It died. Methodist died right there. It's never moved since. Up come the Pentecostals. And what did you do? The General Assembly, known as the Assemblies of God. Oh, you organized yourself. What did you do? Begin to corrode. Then along come the one that's called the New Issue. What did you do? When I organized yourself, God added a little something to the church and you, oh, we got it and you all are out of it. Oh, my brother, that's not God. Amen. Don't you see? What did you do? Died right in the track. God raised up the Christian businessman here in the last days. And if they start the same thing, they'll die right there. That's right. Exactly right. But you never do that. What? What happened? Isaiah saw a great man lose his influence and die. 
And so have we seen the time in this last day that when God is, don't have to raise up a Pentecostal. He could raise up a Presbyterian, a Baptist. He could raise up somebody that's from none of it. Right. He's able to these stones to rise, children of Abraham. And we see him go right outside of the ranks of Pentecost and raise up a man that knows nothing about you and make, a, make you shame of yourself. Then you turn it down and say, oh, nonsense. Why, the praise bird put me right out. Oh, brother. You see where you got? Isaiah saw that lose its hold. And we see those denominations lose their hold. Oh, you're a great number. That's true. It'd be better. God said when you was little, you revered me. And, and I, when you was little, I could talk to you. But when you got so big, I couldn't talk to you. Then you had to run on your own. And that's what we're doing like a great regime, a 16-cylinder Duesenberger. <laughs> we got a political machine in the uh, regime in the, uh, in the uh, movements. It's presbyters and, and all these other different things that dominate the thing and the Holy Spirit's counted out. You try to do something that's a little contrary to your doctrine, then say, oh, nonsense. Check it with the Word. If it's a Word, believe it. If it's not, leave it alone. God will vindicate His Word. Right. How is a kind seen that that man... I'm going to say something. And I don't want to hurt, but I want to make it stick. It was a kind. He saw a man with great influence. What? Lose his hold. Because he failed to keep the Word. Is that right? Now we have lived to see the same day that all these great denominations are losing their influence. God reaches over in another section somewhere, picks up something that's nothing to do with you. See? We see it. These great denominations by their creed lose their whole... Why? They're trying to manufacture something to take the place of the office of the anointed. You know that's the truth. You'll never be able to do it. God will take His anointed. And you cannot impersonate that office. God anoints. He chooses who He wills. He condemns who He wills. It's God that does the justifying. It's God that does the choosing. And He raises it up. And we reject it. And then we see the influence lost. God moves right on in His humility and His way of humbleness and brings a group right out for His name's sake. As he promised he would do. Yeah. We like you as a kind. We see the great denominations lose their place because they try to take the place of the anointed with the denomination instead of taking the anointed word. Hezekiah was a great king. God made him a king. That's all right. But when he tried to take himself and make himself a priest, he couldn't do it. We can make ourselves nothing. You can't make bishops and prophets and so forth. You can't manufacture them. It's got to be born in you. It's got to be the Spirit of God predestinated from the foundation of the world. God said in the church. God did what He did. And when we try to impersonate, we lose our influence. Oh, church, why can't we? Listen, it's like a ball game. Somebody in a football game, somebody gets the ball and every one of his own players trying to take the ball away from him. You can't win the game. Be a guard. Guard the ball. Not try to take it away from the next man. Glory to God. If he can do it over here on this corner, God bless him. I, I, I'm a oneness. I can do it. I'm a Trinitarian. I can do it. He ain't got no business doing that. You're knocking the ball out of your own players' hands. Amen. All you Methodists, Baptists, Presbyterian, Lutherans, oneness, twoness, threeness. If you're riding a one hump camel, two hump camels, or if you've got a dozen humps, what difference does it make? Let's all come to this well. Amen. A fountain filled with blood drawn from him in it. Let's guard the ball. This is the ball. The Holy Spirit's trying to pack it. Amen. It'll condemn communism. It'll condemn sin. It'll Amen. condemn unrighteousness. It'll manifest and glorify Jesus Christ Amen. and bring His person into the midst of the people. Amen. 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 Sure. Praise God. Oh, yes, sir. The vision of the prophet caused a confession. You just get in the presence of God once. You see a vision, a true vision from God. You see how little you are. That's why I'm on the West Coast now. Notice, just get in the presence of God once and see what happens. It. it calls a prophet. What did this prophet? I really am going to close. A prophet, a man of influence, a call man, 
beyond a bishop, beyond a state presbyter, beyond a clergyman, a doctor of degree. He said, I'm a sinner and I'm a man of unclean lips. A man who had an office as a prophet. And when them angels come around him, he recognized that he was a sinner. And yet our women can wear short hair, dance in the spirit. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. Our man can clean their organizations and call everything else a devil that's not with them. And still dance in the spirit and preach the gospel and call themselves. Oh, brother, there's something wrong. It's right. I don't don't get angry. You believe. Just 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 uh, be sincere before God while I finish here a minute. It calls this great prophet to say, I'm a sinner. I'm a man of unclean lips. Then when he's ready to confess, then come the cleansing. Did you notice that? He said, oh, I'm a man undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, so I'm the highest order of spirituality, of the spiritual office in the land. I'm a prophet of this land, but I'm unclean. My lips are not clean. I'm all undone. Woe is me. I see the Lord God of hosts. Hallelujah. When them angels had their faces covered to stand in His presence, then you realize, if the church could only realize that this Holy Spirit is the Lord God of hosts, Cover your face, your feet. Get down. He confessed. Notice, then come his cleansing. Now I'm going to say something. Don't get hurt. His cleansing never come by a creed. It come by fire. His cleansing never come by the declaration of some book. What so and so said. His cleansing came by the fire. The angel went and got fire off the altar and laid it on the prophet's lips. The cleansing comes by Holy Ghost and fire. Not a new bachelor of art or a doctor's degree or something. As Paris Reed had said not long ago when he received the Holy Ghost in my front room, he said, Brother Bram, I've got enough degrees to plaster your wall, but where's God and all of it? He said, has the teachers been wrong? I said, me with the seventh grade education to say the teachers are wrong? I'm not that. They were right in what they taught, I guess, but they never taught far enough. <laughs> Amen. Like the man eating watermelon, he said, that part was good, but there's some more of it. <laughs> Just give him a bite. Then take it away from him. No, sir. It's like feeding a canary bird uh, great big hunks of vitamins to make great big fine speckled wings uh, or wings and make fine bones and make him a big strong bird and then put him in a cage. He can't use it. Let him loose. Let God go to work on him. Put him in action. If he's ready to cover his feet. And... That's right. But I remember it won't work until you cover your feet. You just stand fan wind. I'm assembly. I'm a oneness. I'm this. And you just stand there fanning the wind get nowhere. But once cover your face, cover your feet, then go in action. Lord God, here am I. First there comes a cleansing. Notice, and following the cleansing was a commission. Oh my. Yes. First a confession. Then a cleansing. And then a commission. Why to the cleansed Isaiah was cleansed by the fire. Then he cried out after he was cleansed. Lord. Here am I, send me. Oh, church, businessmen, let's not lose our influence. I'm closing. Let's cover our faces this morning. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I'm nothing. Lord, mold me and make me anew. I'm down in the temple. Let me cover my feet. Lord, I'm nothing. I'm willing to forget all I ever know, like Paul. I know nothing but save Christ and Him crucified. Let me, Lord, humble myself. And then when you raise up from there with a real confession, real cleansing, then when the call comes, who will go for us? Then, Isaiah, you can answer, here am I, say me. Your life will influence your family. It'll influence your neighbors. It'll influence your church. It'll it just put one or two good members in a church that's really on fire for God. It'll do something for that church more than 40 revivals you could have. Right. A good cleansed member. Set an example. The face shining with the glory of God, the sweetness and humility, to stand there in the power of God and watch when somebody gets sick, they'll call that person to come pray. Or you might make fun of them and their tires deflated and so forth. You might all this nonsense say, but let death strike you one time. You find out when them struggles begins to come who that real sincere person is in the church. Here am I, Lord, send me. Let my influence be upon others, Lord. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. 
Let this word influence me in my prayers, Lord. While I'm in this valley here of the Maricopa Valley, the little sunspot of the world, may I be able to be in contact with the Son of God that would scatter sunshine of the Holy Spirit throughout the valley and it will cause brethren and women, sisters, and even sinners to find this fountain filled with blood. May we all come to the place of the temple where we can recognize ourselves unclean and live such a life that will influence others to love Christ. Let us pray. While we have our heads bowed, I'm going to hum real... I can't sing. You all just hum it with me when I speak the words. When the coal of fire had touched the prophet, making him as pure as pure could be, when the voice of God said, Who will go for us? Then he answered, Master, here, send me. Speak, my Lord. All together now. Speak, my Lord. Speak, and I'll be quick to answer thee. Speak, my Lord. Speak, my Lord. Speak. Now listen, millions now in sin and shame are dying. Listen to their sad and bitter cry. Hasten, brother, hasten to their rescue. Quickly answer, Master, here am I. All it wants to go raise your hands now. Speak, my Lord. Lord, speak, my Lord, speak, and I'll be quick to answer thee. Speak, my Lord, speak, my Lord, speak, and I will answer, Lord. Father, let that be the depths of our heart, Lord. Truly, millions now in sin and shame are dying. Right here in the city of Phoenix, literally thousands groping in sin. And here we stand this morning enshrouded with the presence of the Holy Spirit. We're all conscious of His august presence. I feel Him in my heart. I feel Him upon the people. Oh God, may a vision come to us that we can see the holiness of God. See how little we are. May the temple post be moved in our presence and there, while we're in His presence, Lord. May the power of the Holy Spirit just shake us so, Lord, that not only the temple post will be moved, but the post in our heart will be moved. The post of indifference that will let the door of God's opportunity to come in. Be moved away, the stone of unbelief taken away. And let us, Lord, answer quickly. Master, I humble myself. I want wings over my feet and over my face. First, Lord, humble me that I might be influenced to the others. Grant it, Lord. Bless this convention. Bless this meeting coming on. And these churches, these my brethren, Lord, in the face of opposition, they've called me and asked me to come down and speak in their churches. Oh, God, light each candle. Grant it, Lord. May there come such a light, such a great revival across Phoenix. Grant, Lord, that this will be done amongst all the churches and all your people and all the places and all the denominations. And many of those precious souls out here on the street are looking and wondering and waiting to see the life of Christ being manifested among His people. Grant it, Lord. We might not be able to influence the whole city, Hardly ever that was ever done. There's all in there. The wheat and terriers are together. But Lord, may we be so enthused that we'll try to light one little candle each day by telling someone else, doing something that will influence others to know you and to love you. For to know you is life. 
We pray this blessing. Bless our brother Williams here, Lord, and sister Williams. We love them. They're, they're, they're your servants. We believe in humility, Lord. They're bowing at your feet. We're so glad to see how you are working among their family, with their, their daughters and their, and their sons. How gracious you are to them. Brother Rose and so many of the others, your Lord, a man, a, a great man, and my minister brothers that's around over the town, and my sisters, Lord, that, that they're your children. And I, I want to put my shoulder with them, with them, Lord. I want to press hard. Help me, oh God. I'm, I'm small, I'm little, and I can't push very hard. Lord, let me stand there and you do the pushing. Grant it, Lord, that we might be able to move the great load of God into the kingdom of God. Grant it, Father. We commit this all to you now as we go forward from this day and we commit ourselves and we pray for a great revival and a, may the Christian businessman be able to pick up from there and go right on and may it, as soon as they, the convention's over, may the churches be all on fire and the revival moving on and on and on. May we be able to start the fire, Lord, and may the Holy Spirit fan those blazes until the whole community around is burning with Pentecostal fire. Grant it, Lord. We commit it all to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, thy Son, Amen. I'm sorry to have held you so long because now it's almost noon time. We might as well stay for dinner, I guess. And so, but I'm, I'm grateful to be here. Your fellowship, your cooperation has been much. And my brothers, how many in here that I'm going to be in your churches this week? Raise your hands around. That's fine. Brothers and sisters around. Thank you. And we'll all invite you over this week to the meetings. Now I'll turn it to Brother Williams here now for the closing. He can do this job right, better than I can. Bow your head just a minute then. How many wants down to the altar this morning? Really, truly, I want an altar call in your heart. Raise up your hands. God, make me what I ought to be. I, I'm the clay. You're the pope. God bless you. God bless you. Now, as you put your hands down, is there someone here that never has accepted Christ? Don't know what it means. You maybe you just, or oh, maybe under some influence that never did you a bit of good. As soon as the influence like went off, some little spell of emotion. Or, but you went on living the same life, or maybe you never have accepted Him at all. And you'd like to say this morning, God, let that word sink into me until I can cover my face in humility and cover my feet and kneel at your altar until the, the seraphims will wave the glory of God over my soul and cleanse me with His holy fire. Would you raise up your hand and say, Brother Bram, pray for me. I'm here in need of prayer. But God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Well, God bless you. That You raise your hand. You make a decision in your heart. God bless you, my brother. Someone else, some of our sisters here, raise your hand and say, Brother Branham, I don't believe that it's so that you're... That you say that it called you a woman hater? I don't believe that. I believe you love me as your sister, and I do, sister. But I'm only trying to tell you, I don't want you to be influenced by Marilyn Monroe. I want you to be influenced by Jesus Christ and by His Word. He is the Word. And if the Word don't influence you, then Christ came because He is the Word. You know that. I dreamed a dream not long ago, or vision, rather. It wasn't a dream. I I was out in the woods on a patrol. And I seen two women, and one of them had one Pentecostal church road, and the other and the other. And he said, one said, Sister, do you think it's right for Brother Bram to ball us out like that? said, if Jesus was here, said, he probably wouldn't say it. And they didn't know who I was. And I stand there, and I said, well, now listen, the man must be right. No matter whether you've never seen Jesus, yes or no, or whether he's sure he can't change his word, he'd be just the same. They said, well, that's really right, isn't it? Oh, can't you see it's right, Brother Sister? Can't you see if Christ can't change his word? He is the word. Would there be some more? Raise your hand. Say, remember me, Brother Branham. I know I'm not right. Pray for me now. Would you just raise your hand? God bless you. You mean that. Bless you. Bless you. That's good. That's fine. God bless you. Just really mean it from your heart. We're coming to the end of the road now. Just a little while longer. Maybe in the convention tonight's a speak, and I have a night, one night at least in the convention. I want to speak on some of those things. Just the, something is from my heart and the very reason I'm standing here this morning. There's people right in here can say amen and amen. The reason I'm standing here this morning. <laughs> Something has happened that never happened before in my life. That's right. It's, it's happened. And he called me right here to Arizona. I'm here for something. Um, millions now in sin and shame are dying. Just listen to their sad and bitter cry. What makes people do wrong? It's a thirst in them. God made them to thirst. See? Thirst after Him. And they're trying to satisfy that 
that holy call with things of the world, joining a church, being influenced to a dance or something. They're trying to satisfy that holy thing that God put in them to thirst after Him. And what they're doing, they're trying to, to let the devil uh, satisfy them by giving them some other thing that isn't satisfying. Oh, God, let it be taken away this morning. Oh, how I'd like to see this group of people just uh, so anointed with the Holy Spirit. As you go out of here, there'd just be something happened to you. Just something that would take us all from here. Me with you, friend. All of us together, go out of here under the influence of the Holy Spirit to win souls for Jesus Christ. Now, with been about 30 hands up that wants to come to get right with God, there's been at least 8 or 10 or more of that that's sinners that's never had accepted Him. Let us pray. And down in your heart, you believe it. That's all you can do is believe. It's up to God to do the rest. Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. That's all Abraham could do. He had to believe. God had to do the imputing. That's all you can do is believe. Just sincerely now bow your head or your table or wherever you're at. And let's pray. Lord God, I do realize if there had only been one hand, what sort of a prayer could I make for that person? Just as the Holy Spirit would lead my heart. I want to sit where they are as a sinner, knowing not Christ and His salvation. One day I accepted you, Lord. I didn't know how to... I'll never forget it. Lord, it changed my life. And I know that's not contrary to the Word. It's with the Word. So, Father, in my humble way of doing it, will you receive those who raise their hands? And even those who did not, if they have not receive them, Lord. Take all the world out. Take all the desires of the world out. Take it from my brethren, from my sisters. Take it from me, Lord. I'm with them. We're all in the temple of God. And we realize that our littleness, how little we are. How small and insignificant we are. And how great thou art. Oh, Jehovah, be merciful to me, sinners. I plead for us all, Lord. Take this little group and I this morning. Cleanse us, Lord. Make us new creatures. Won't you please? In my little humble way of asking you, Father, I offer this in the name of Jesus Christ that you will receive it. I now commit myself to God. I commit my ways, all my thinking, my doing. May I not think no more of my thoughts. May I not more have any ways of the world. May they all be cleansed. May I just have pure, holy thoughts from this day on. May my whole life be His. Speak to me. Lord, I, I wouldn't say do that unless you had ordained it. You ordained your gospel to be preached by man. You could ordain the wind to preach it. You could ordain the stars to preach it. You could ordain the moon, the sun to preach it. But you ordain man. You won't change it. You're waiting on man. You're not waiting on the stars. They'll obey you. The winds will obey you. But Lord, we man, we're no good. We don't obey you. Lord, forgive us, won't you? Won't you forgive us? Forgive us, Lord. To make us ministers, all of us, each one in his own his own way, each one in his his own environment, each one in his own way, where he can do the best. We just commit ourselves to you now. Make us servants of yours, ministers of the word. In Jesus' name, I offer this prayer. And you taught us all that we must pray like this: Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Don't never let it die. He careth for thee, He careth for you, through sunshine or shadow, He careth for you. Did he not express it? Now, right across the table, let's shake each other's hands. Just remain seated. He for say God bless you, pilgrim.